Good afternoon. Hey, everybody was getting quiet, so I figured that's a signal for me that we should start. Huh? That's good. So welcome to the 26th annual Lesbotech Lecture. I'm Professor Roger Schrader, SVD. I'm the holder of the Louis J. Lesbotech SVD Chair of Mission and Culture here at CTU. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land, the people, the indigenous people of this land. We acknowledge this land, which was once occupied and revered by the Council of the Three Fires, comprised of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We thank these early inhabitants of Chicago for the way they revered this generous land. Let us remember indigenous peoples of all the Americas. In a particular way, I'd like to remember the peoples of Lakota people in South Dakota. Some of us will be going there on Thursday to be with them. A 40 year relationship between CTU and the Lakota people there. This time now, I'd like to invite our VP and Academic Dean Fernando Corey to offer the official CTU welcome. Thank you so much, Roger. Well, I break Tulsi's son's glass. Let me pick it back up. I am Fernando Corey, the Academic Dean of Catholic Theological Union. On behalf of our president, Sister Barbara Reed, the CTU family, it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the 26th edition of the Elizabeth Tech Lecture. To those who are here present, and to those joining us online, a warm welcome to CTU. CTU was founded to participate in the mission of God in the world by preparing men and women for ministry in the church and leadership in the world. This is integral to CTU's core mission and vision. Since joining CTU as a corporate member, the Chicago province of the Divine World Missionaries the religious community of Father Louis Luzbetek continues to amplify CTU's commitment to mission in the church and the mandate to preach the gospel message across cultures by sponsoring an endowed chair on mission and culture. This annual lecture appropriately bears the name of Father Louis Luzbetek a cultural anthropologist and a communically recognized pioneer in the field of missionary anthropology to advance um, the promotion of integral connection between Christianity, peoples, and cultures. The scholarship of Father Luzbetek and the ministry of the SVD remind me of the words of Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium on the relationship between culture and the gospel message. Pope Francis strongly teaches, which I think undergirds Father Luzbetek's scholarship, that the history and the role of the church in the plan of God for the salvation of the world does not have one cultural expression. But remaining completely true to itself with unwavering fidelity to the proclamation of the gospel and the tradition of the church it will also reflect different faces of cultures and peoples in which it is received and takes root. Now, as we gather to honor Father Luzbete with an academic presentation close to his heart and scholarship, it is my honor to welcome back to the podium, Professor Roger Schroeder, the Louis J. Luzbetek Professor Mission and Culture to introduce our speaker. Uh, 
Thank you, Ferdinand. I'd just like to follow up with a few more words that Ferdinand has already introduced to us in terms of Louis Lesbitek, for whom we this lectureship was named. I knew Louis, I said call him Louis, Louis Lesbitek, Louis. I knew him personally, of course, over the years. It's amazing that he already published a book in 1963 about church and culture. This is the beginning of Vatican II. So already before Vatican II, he was already seriously as an anthropologist and as a missionary looking at these questions of mission and culture. So he published his book in 1963. Later on in 1988, he revised the whole book in a very in light of Vatican II. So he added the Vatican II understanding of church and things like that. So he made a big change. I was actually in Rome at that time when he was preparing that second draft and sort of assisted him as a doctoral student at the time, just sort of with, as he was doing some technical work, I was doing some technical work with him. His work has been very much, is very much appreciated by conciliar Protestants, evangelicals, and of course by Catholics. It's interesting that when we used to have, for many years, the annual Society of Missiology conferences at Techni on the north side, the SVD house, a number of the evangelicals would come to me and say, where is Louis buried? Where is Father Luzertek? They wouldn't call him Louis. That's me. Okay, they say, where is Father Luzertek buried? So during the conference, they'd go to the cemetery at Techni in order to acknowledge him because they really respected the work that he did at that time. So we're going to proceed with the lecture. Just to let you know, for those of you on Zoom, very happy to have you. If you have any particular questions as we during the lecture, you can put them on the chat, and we'll have an opportunity during the Q&A to also field some of your questions as well. So this time I'd like to invite Steve Bevins, who's the initial holder of the Lesbitek chair, in order to introduce our speaker. Thanks very much, Roger. And uh, thank you, Ferdinand, for your words of welcome. Um, you know, it's always a, a pleasure to introduce the annual Lusbatek lecturer. And I've been honored to have this pleasure a good number of times uh, in the last 26 years. However, today, it's even a greater pleasure to introduce a respected and treasured colleague as Lusbatek lecturer. So it's once again the case that I can do this as I introduce my colleague and friend, Ton Sison. As many of us know, Ton is a member of the Missionaries of the Precious Blood and is Professor of Systematic Theology and Culture here at CTU, and he holds the Vatican Council II Chair of Theology. Ton holds an MA in Theology from the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines, and a doctorate in theology from the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. He's taught here at CTU, I'm not exactly sure, Tom, but I figure around 20 years, something like that, and has published a good number of articles and four books, the latest of which is the acclaimed uh, Indigenous Enculturation, Grace on the Edge of Genius, which he published in 2021 and then his recently edited Deep Enculturation, Global Voices on Christian Faith and Indigenous Genius, published just this past spring. Ton's work upholds the great tradition at CTU as being on the cutting edge of writings on enculturation and contextual theology a tradition pioneered by such greats as Robert Schreiter, his confrere, and Anthony Gittens, both of whom are Ton's predecessors as Lusbatek lectures in years past. Ton has become a, a close friend, and I look forward to our regular dinners of Filipino pancit 
at uh, Noodles Etc. on 50, 57th Street. But even more stimulating than the noodles are the theological conversations that we have at those times. Uh, Ton's meticulous scholarship, his artistic sensibility, as you see already, uh, and uh, his elegant writing style are qualities that I personally envy very much. And it will be these qualities that he will share with us in his Luspatek lecture this afternoon. So let's give a warm welcome for our Luspatek lecture this, for 2024, Ton Sison. Ton. Wow, I don't recognize myself after that intro. <laughs> but thank you, Steve, for such a generous and uh, sincere intro that could only come from a friend. And uh, I actually wrote a, a very short list of people to thank because I might forget somebody. But, uh, well, I guess I forgot that list. But <laughs> thank you to our dean. Yeah, I know, like, happy Tuesday. <laughs> so, but thank you to our dean for making time to be here. I know you're learning the skill of bilocation. Thank you. Um, I have precious blood confreres who are here and online. Thank you for making the time. And uh, students, uh, uh, good friends, and uh, also my co my colleagues like Laurie Brink, who's here, and Vantan Nguyen. Uh, but I'm grateful of, to Roger Schrader for the gracious invite to be the 26th Luzbetak lecturer. You know, Roger has been such a wonderful support in my theological journey, a quiet support, because Roger's not the type who would banner, uh, you know, what he does. He's very humble, and so, but nonetheless, extremely supportive. I can only, uh, I'm at a loss for words for saying thank you to Roger. He's helped me so much as a wisdom figure. And of course, Steve Bevins. Um, actually, Steve, just a minor correction. My MA is from Mary Hill School of Theology in the Philippines, where Steve used to teach. Although we never met there, I met him through his book, Context, Models of Contextual Theology, which continues to illumine what I do until this day, to, the very, uh, to this very day that I'm writing. Uh, Steve has been, uh, you know, sort of like a light because his uh, Models of Contextual Theology is a wonderful cartography uh, I'm, I call it a map quest for contextual theology. So always grateful, Steve. So anyway, I'm here to share the fruit of uh, my research, which had, which had began just a few months ago. I am currently on study leave. And thanks to the uh, OCX Sullivan grant of CTU, which uh, jump started my research, uh, I am ready to share a little bit of uh, what I've done so far. I have a year to go. So this is a, a partial report of what I've done. So the title of my talk is The Pyramid Beneath a Church, Causing Muted Signs to Speak in Enculturation. There's a Catholic church built on top of an ancient pyramid in Cholula, a town in Puebla. Uh, and that's where you do, that's where you should do on-site research on enculturation. So this suggestion came from my colleague and good friend, Angel Mendez Montoya, um, during a 2018 colloquium held at the Universidad Iberoamericana, Mexico's premier Jesuit university, where he teaches. Now, six years later in 2021, my book came out, The Art of Indigenous Enculturation, but it did not include Cholula. Lost but not forgotten, the pyramid beneath a church lay dormant in a mental file for a few years. This year, I finally had the opportunity to be there twice, uh, but this is uh, my fourth time in Mexico. I have had a, a sort of like a, a little love affair with Mexico. I, I'm very uh, enamored at the culture uh, over there, especially the religious culture. And um, I can share this with you at least in part since it belongs to a larger ongoing project, as I mentioned. So just a note to clarify that I am neither tourist nor dilettante. 
I also cannot claim to be a native informant or the expert on enculturation in the Mexican context of Cholula, especially. I am, however, a theologian born and raised in the Philippines, where the only Christianity I have always known is a post-colonial one. I am a co-seeker in the Global South Ecumen um, that I belong to by virtue of my birth. Last June, I expressed this sentiment to Angel, my Mexican friend, and he replied, well, what you bring is identification. I identify with Mexicans, the Mexican story because it mirrors my own. To begin, it would be helpful to clarify what enculturation means in its current ferment in contextual theology and mission. Okay. The concept of enculturation recognizes that beyond the broadly used anthropological term acculturation, which denotes a, an intercultural connection based on a frame of tolerance, or more aptly, a marriage of convenience is what I call it, or A plus B equals AB, it's a simple formula there. Enculturation is wedded by a certain dynamic equivalence, a relationship of mutual encounter, assimilation, oops, my uh, clicker died on me. So I'm doing it manually. Um, mutual encounter, assimilation, and enrichment between Christian culture and a given local culture, birthing a tertium quid, a third thing. Theologically speaking, this third thing is a new creation. So instead of like a side-by-side -side, uh, relationship based on tolerance, we have a dynamic equivalence between these two cultures. However helpful the simple formula may be, enculturation cannot be determined by some exact mathematical equation. I've never been good at math anyway. It is a path, a performance, a praxis. Like the continuing process of art making, the theological task in enculturation is a critical and creative reflection in via, on the way. Beyond inherited ways of understanding and doing enculturation as a missionary tactic from above, this is an older uh, defunct missiology, my project has been to turn the hermeneutical prism to reveal new diverse facets of an enculturation from within, a deep enculturation born from the creative and often heroic faith of underrepresented communities who have in the power of their own indigenous genius upheld their, their cultural identity and historical agency while seeking religious synthesis. This is not a smooth and seamless endeavor by any means. In a given local culture that had served the sentence of colonial history, one is often faced with what can be described as muted signs. And by this, I mean the local religio-cultural heritage that had been vanquished, defaced, and silenced by an unwelcome dominant foreign culture. This encompasses material religion, material culture, and intangible heritage, the indigenous value systems and the webs of significance that undergird them. In the unholy marriage of the colonial enterprise and a missionizing agenda, based on a national messianic complex, and this was particularly evident in the Spanish conquest in Latin America and the Philippines in the 16th century. The Christian message was delivered in billowing smoke and cold-bladed steel, in unmitigated plunder of ancestral gold and treasures, in iconoclastic popping operations, um, the flattening of pagan sites to create a tabula rasa, a blank slate upon which to build over Christian structures, and ultimately in the mass murder of entire groups of indigenous peoples with particular cruelty 
meted out against the custodians and flame tenders of cultural memory and heritage, the priests of the indigenous religions. Having said that, scholars who advocate for a serious consideration of enculturation in the global South need to ask this question. What are some of the creative analytical approaches that may prove useful or helpful in causing muted signs to speak anew? I am not speaking about the existing methodological frameworks or meta strategies that had already been proposed many times. I'm speaking of specific methodological approaches that can be applicable in the praxis of theologizing enculturation and doing enculturation. At stake here is the very notion of enculturation. For if historically the local culture was never really given an equal seat at the Lord's table, how could there have been a birthing of a new creation? Could it be that an authentic enculturation after five decades of missiological theories and discussion was scarcely understood at all? There are a few creative approaches I engaged in my ongoing study, but in the interest of time, I'll be focusing on just two, so thank you. <laughs> First, a hermeneutics of serendipity, uh, which I first proposed in 2021 and still continue to employ. And two, the Rashomon effect. Sounds Greek, right? No, it's Japanese, actually, which I will introduce today. So let's proceed then. First, a hermeneutics of serendipity. So I had configured my research as a kind of pilgrimage, which I hope to get that I hope that you would get a taste of this afternoon, virtually at least. A good place to begin our trek is this place, Santa Maria Tonancintla. It is a town within the municipality of Puebla, a very small town, about four miles from Cholula, which is where the, the pyramid picture uh, you saw uh, is. The name Tonanzintla immediately captured my imagination as it is linked with the word Tonan or Tonanzin, uh, a sobriquet used by the Aztecs to express recognition of and personal connection with a maternal figure, literally our mother or our dear mother. You've probably heard this in association with Our Lady of Guadalupe. There seems to be a consensus among anthropologists and theologians that Tonantzin is not the proper name of a particular fertility or earth goddess um, who can be securely defined in the Aztec Cosmo vision. Rather, Tonantzin points to a figure or a genus of the divine feminine believed to have been, to have had a devotional following in indigenous cultic practice. So literally, Santa Maria Tonantzintla means the place of our dear mother Maria. According to Puebla-based anthropologist Julio Glockner, the Tonantzin Maria Convergence came to fruition because the indigenous community itself recognized in the figure of the Immaculate Conception with the moon as her pedestal and a serpent underfoot, the cosmic maternal named Tonantzin. The symbols of the moon and the serpent worked as visual analogs of the symbols of fertility and the perpetuity of life in the indigenous cosmovision. Now, like a moth drawn to a light, I was very excited to be here. I walked the front atrio of the town's main church, and what you see here on the slide is Templo de Santa Maria Tonanzintla. Beginning in the mid-16th century, the construction of the church building was carried out in four phases, um, with its finishing touches going on until the uh, 19th to early 20th century. As you can see, the exterior of the church has a rather low-key appeal. Uh, certainly, it did not cue me uh, in the slightest to see, to expect what to behold uh, when I went inside. So. Upon stepping into the narthex or foyer of the church, I found it difficult to put my visceral experience into words. Dreamscape. I felt transported into the threshold of a dream. 
through the length of the church interior and for almost every square inch within the range of my vision uh, of the sanctuary and the altar mayor, an iconographic kaleidoscope appears to break through a heavenly dome portal. Cherubim bedecked in golden plumes afloat in fruits and blossoms are caught up in some celestial choreography circling around a Catholic pantheon of images. As suggested earlier, the name Santa Maria Tonanzintla already offers the interpretive keys to this spectacle of sacred art. First, this is a church that honors the special role of the Virgin Mary in the medieval understanding of salvation history. The elevated level of Marian iconography, now looking at it from the press and backwards, the four Marian dogmas are represented here iconographically. Plus, the coronation of the Virgin Mary is also here. So this is a, a full representation of uh, like a, Mary, a Mariology. Uh, the elevated level of Marian iconography amid the grandeur of the artistic bricolage together herald a maximalist Marian theology. Characteristic of the Catholic imagination of the friars and conquistadors of the 16th century by friars, mainly Franciscans, because they were the first to be there. Where's Silberto? Silberto's not here, so I can say anything now about the Franciscans. <laughs> the same intense fervor would uh, contribute to the enkindling of Marian devotion in New Spain, notably buttressing the already rising devotion to the enculturated icon of Nuestra Senora de Guadalupe. It belongs to that whole move uh, to promote Mariology in that century. On another level, this is a temple that offers creative space for both Spanish Catholic and indigenous religio-cultural expressions. While Santa Maria Tonanzintla is decidedly a Catholic church, the architectural work and elaborate Artistic renderings invested here bear the fingerprints of unnamed indigenous builders and artisans. That's quite fascinating. Just looking at this picture, uh, it was very hard to wrap my brains around what I was seeing. It was so elaborate. Uh, you know, if we use a Baroque term, you can describe this as horror vacui which means that there's a fear of space, that you have to fill it with all these ornamentations. Uh, this is typical of a Baroque style. Now, this was made by unnamed artisans uh, from the indigenous community, commissioned by the church, by the missionaries. Historians and anthropologists note that the building of the Catholic churches was one task that the indigenous community took on with great enthusiasm, preferring it over other Christianizing activities such as masses or indoctrination classes uh, at the mission schools, both of which were met with great resistance. Notwithstanding oppressive colonial labor conditions, the indigenous artists gained the opportunity to exercise artistic freedom to such an extent that they themselves had a hand in the creative options of the overall church design during the building process. Now, this is evident in the striking indigenous influences that also mark several st church structures of the period. And also several of these church st structures are located in Puebla. Puebla is a, a historic heritage municipality. It's uh, quite fascinating. We see indigenous looking cherubim with darker clay toned skin alongside European looking figures, identifiable local fruit and produce such as bananas, chilies, and cobs of maize, and symbols from ancestral myths that are familiar to the discerning eye of a native informant. The unique stylistic admixture of Tonantzintla has been described as Mexican indigenous Baroque. In its original European basis, as we know from church history, the Baroque was reflective of the move by the Reformation era church, Catholic church, to banner dogma through exuberant artistic and sensory expression, as seen in the grandiose painting of the artist El Greco. Paintings such as this bespeak the religious aesthetics well suited for the counter-reformation campaign in Spain. 
in its imported incarnation in New Spain, the Baroque aesthetics a uh, manipulative potency worked to devitalize indigenous pictographic and mythic cultural heritage. They're trying to erase uh, the, the uh, cultural expressions of uh, the, the pagans, the so-called pagans. This would, however, take on an astonishing turn. The religious labors of colonized people brought about an intercultural miracle of sorts, pivoting pivoting serendipitously to the benefit of the indigenous culture. In my previous work, I propose a hermeneutics of serendipity to bring to light how unexpected historical turns kindled liberative currents that allowed for the flourishing of the indigenous culture's creative genius in the face of colonial and post-colonial curtailment. In the serendipitous alignment of historical circumstance, circumstance and indigenous creativity, the Baroque aesthetic became an open system within a closed system, a site of creative resistance where indigenous cultural identity is affirmed and made visible. For the Cuban writer, Jose Maria Lima, this represents contra conquista, the very act of counter conquest. The argument that the Mexican indigenous Baroque evinces contra conquista finds furious validation in the artistic masterwork of Santa Maria Tonanzintla. Beyond its Catholic basis, the Tonanzintla aesthetic universe is also subversively and un unapologetically indigenous. I would argue, however, that the hermeneutical pendulum ought not to stop there. I submit that the Contra Conquista argument does not go far enough to account for the fact that the material religion that birthed from such an act of subversion uh, profoundly expresses a dialogical relationship, an intercultural marriage based on mutuality. Tonanzintla is that reconciled thing. Oops. A new creation. Over time, its aesthetic legacy had become much more than the sum of its parts. It is at one and the same time, Nahua, which is the dominant uh, indigenous group with a common language in, uh, among the Aztecs. It is at one at the same time, Nahua and Christian. In the same manner that its compound name does not demand preferring one side over the other, it's not Tonantzin versus Maria, you know, this is not a boxing match. Uh, Santa Maria Tonantzintla is a temple of the intercultural both and. Now we're just starting. Okay. Oops. The next stop of the pilgrimage, it's Cholula. These are all within walking distance. It's the same sort of environs. Uh, so it's very consistent. What is happening in one place is, uh, chances are, is also happening in another. So the second point is the Rashomon effect. And now we're if this is a pilgrimage, we're walking towards the pyramid. Here you go, in full color. Let me take you to Cholula. And you should know by now that I'm not referring to the hot sauce that you buy at Jewel Osco. Okay. Cholula is a small off the beaten track, historic city within the municipal boundaries of Puebla. As I set foot in the city, for those of you who have been to Mexico, the mid-afternoon afternoon sun is ablaze. It's a celestial ball of white fire, is how I described it, that renders the clear blue sky at an even higher resolution. And to be honest, I was dealing with a high altitude sickness and with only free pretzels from United in my belly <laughs> to, to fuel my, my pilgrimage. <laughs> so in front of me is Tlachihuatepetl the Great Pyramid of Cholula, which stands at 217 feet, uh, about half the height of Egypt's Pyramid of Giza, but second to none in terms of sheer volume and base area. Over time, the greater part of the ancient structure had been hidden in dense overgrowth. You can see some of the overgrowth here, uh, appearing to be a natural mountain at first glance but sections of the base area of the pyramid uncovered through a series of archeological excavations confirmed that this is so-called mountain was made by human hands. 
I could only stand in astonishment at the scale and complexity of the pyramid, picturing in my mind's eye its original stature as a living, bustling center for commerce, artisanship, kinship, and worship. This is a, a nerve center for all these activities uh, during uh, prior to the contact, the Spanish contact or conquest. Interestingly, it's not the archeological zone, but the medieval Catholic church perched atop the massive ancient pyramid. I'm sure you see the, the small church on top. Mm -hmm. This is what grabs my attention. The image is unusual. Uh, I mean, how many times have you seen a church perched on top of a very large pyramidal structure? Uh, as I stayed with my curiosity for a few moments, something clicked in my mind. The image of a fairy tale castle on a hill from the picture books of my childhood. No other time of day does Cholula take on an enchanted aura of a fairy tale castle than after sunset, when the Great Pyramid is obscured by darkness and the church is elevated into a luminous heavenly crown. In display of light and shadow, it is magical to behold. It even does, you know, the picture doesn't even do justice uh, to the experience when you're right in front of it. It's, uh, it's mind boggling. I couldn't wrap my brains around uh, the image. Now the visual story before me, born of the triumphalist utopian dreams of medieval men from Spain, is a tale told by unreliable narrators. I have heard this story before in Peru, in Colombia, in my birth country, the Philippines, the list goes on. I submit that one needs to excavate beyond the surface to get closer to a truthful version of the story. If adobe bricks could speak, the Great Pyramid itself will have a very different narrative to share. This is a retracing of an ancient pictographic representation of the Cholula massacre uh, from uh, indigenous hands. Cholula was the site of a major historical event of brutal violence that occurred in October of 1519. So serendipitously, we are commemorating the Cholula massacre, even as we look into this in a modest way. Um, in the widely reported genocide, the Spanish conquistadors under the command of Hernán Cortés attacked and killed in cold blood thousands of unwitting residents of Cholula who were instructed in a pretense of goodwill to assemble at the main ceremonial plaza of the pyramid complex. Exploiting the existing feud between the different indigenous groups, the Spanish contingent formed alliances with local rival groups. This is typical colonial strategy, by the way. And together they attacked Cholula with the longer view of conquering the ruling Mexica Empire, whose seat of power was located in Me Mexico, Tenochtitlan, which is the present day Mexico City. The Cholula massacre foreshadows the next major move, the, actually the bigger move, which is to conquer the capital, what is now the capital, Tenochtitlan. So what is the Rashomon effect that I mentioned and how is it applicable to Cholula? The Rashomon effect describes a case or situation where individuals, each claiming knowledge of the truth, give divergent but seemingly conceivable accounts of the self-same event. There is consensus about the occurrence of the event, but different truths are said about it. The expository device has found usage across disciplines. I'm not the first to use this, maybe in theology, but in other disciplines, it's been used in anthropology, psychology, sociology, journalism, and even legal studies. Uh, but its true roots are in cinema studies. For those of you who know me quite well, this is a uh, I think this might be a throwback <laughs> of my previous interest. <laughs> okay, Rashomon, which refers to the South Gate of the Imperial capital of Kyoto during Japan's Heian period, this is about 794 to 1195 CE, 
It's a 1950 film written and lensed by the celebrated Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa. The plot revolves around four conflicting eyewitness accounts on the murder of a samurai warrior. A woodcutter, a bandit, and the samurai's wife narrate different versions of the incident. And surprise, surprise, it gets interesting. Through a medium, the slain samurai himself gives a testimony about his own death. Now, the film constantly problematizes the reliability of narration or the lack thereof, as each version of the story is self-serving and angled to put the narrator in a flattering light. In the end, the film leaves the case open-ended, holding up all the testimonies in perpetual tension. So here you go. What's the connection to Cholula? In the case of Cholula, what is a researcher to do when there are several chroniclers from the immediate post-conquest period, namely unnamed indigenous narrators and scribes working under the supervision, of course, of missionary friars, the Spanish missionary friars themselves, uh, firstly, the Franciscans, and then the Augustinians, and um, what's the third group? The Dominicans, how can I forget? <laughs> Each of them give multiple, multiple versions of the massacre, each with its own accentuations and omissions. If this sounds like biblical hermeneutics, it really does. <laughs> Where's my water? Okay. Water break. For me, no other approach fits as hand in glove to this case as the Rashomon effect Time is short, so I'll skip the fine details, but let's bring to the virtual witness stand, Rashomon style, some of these testimonies. Testimony number one. The first testimony is from the Franciscan missionary friar, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, in his encyclopedic general history of the things of New Spain, are popular, popularly known as the Florentine Codex. By the way, so now they republished this. There's a new version with accessible language. So it's quite affordable on Amazon for nerds out there. Sagun arrived in Mexico in 1529. That's eight years after the completion of the conquest. For a colonial document subjected to a Spanish friar's revision and editing, the account of the massacre is surprisingly straightforward as it clearly identifies the Cholula massacre as an act as an act of Spanish treachery. That's his testimony. It's worth noting that in the 30 year period of its writing, Sahagun did painstaking cultural spade work learned the indigenous language and depended on the narrative shared from memory by elderly Nahua informants. Despite its colonial biases, in his intro, he already expresses a colonial agenda, if you read it. Now, it's still considered an important 16th century reference for the study of indigenous culture. Now, the bottom line here is that he points out that the massacre was an act of Spanish treachery. Testimony number two, lo and behold, the conquistador himself, Hernan Cortes, has his own version of the story. So as he takes the Rashomon witness stand, Cortes reports that the incident was a preemptive attack following a warning of an ambush supposedly plotted by the locals. According to this account, the warm hospitality offered by the Cholulans quickly soured. In fact, it's funny. Some accounts say it's like, oh, first they gave us food and now they're not giving us food anymore. It's like so belly driven. <laughs> Stirring up suspicion and distrust among the ranks of the Spaniards. Now this boils over when Malintzin or Doña Marina, popularly known as La Malinche, which means the embodiment of treachery in popular understanding, an indigenous woman who served as an advisor interpreter to Cortes is said to have spilled the beans regarding a plot, a plot to ambush the Spaniards. 
offer them as human sacrifices and then cannibalize them. Now, because of this, Cortes and the conquistadors commence the attack. It's notable that in the story, an indigenous woman is blamed for the annihilation of her own people. Latina and Chicana feminist artists and scholars such as Cordelia Candelaria, employing a hermeneutics of suspicion, have reinterpreted Malintzin as a feminist prototype, a survivor and a strong female figure who disrupts patriarchal power. Now, Cortes emphasizes that the Cholulans had knowledge of the impending onslaught, noting that the city's women and children have been previously evacuated. This also serves as a prior claim that the fatalities of the attack were limited to the men, at least according to this account. There's good reason for Cortes to establish that the attack was provoked, thus preemptive. His account was part of his second letter to the King of Spain, where he pleads his case for his unauthorized and illegal invasion of Mexico. So you see in the Rashomon effect, each testimony is skewed uh, to flatter the one who's giving the testimony. This is exactly what I see in the testimonies regarding the Cholula massacre. The third testimony is given by someone you know, Fray Bartolomé de las Casas, Dominican prior. He earned the title protector of the American Indians precisely for his advocacy um, for the, the oppressed indigenous. In his controversial account, The Devastation of the Indies, published in 1552, two years after his retirement as the Bishop of Chiapas, Las Casas writes a scathing account of the Cholula massacre that uh, categorically indicts Cortes and the conquistadors. In the longer account that follows what you read on the slide, I can't give you the longer account, it's too long, but here's a little bit of a summary. It says in the longer account, then at the command, all the Spaniards drew their swords or spears, and while the native chiefs looked on, helpless, all those tame sheep were butchered and cut to pieces. Moreover, Las Casas contradicts Cortes claimed that the women and children were spared. Summarizing the military exploits of the conquistadors, he uh, asserts, the Spaniards have killed more Indians here in 12 years by the sword, by fire and enslavement than anywhere else in the Indies. They have killed young and old, men, women, and children. I was emotional when I was reading Las Casas. Um, you know, it hits you. It happened in the 16th century, but it is not nonetheless scandalous and shocking that such a massacre happened. In whatever part of the timeline you belong to, it doesn't become less shocking because it's older. It's an older account. It's so shocking to me and almost traumatizing because it mirrors also what happened in my country. So anyway, expressing a preferential option for the oppressed indígena, Las Casas takes the tone of a denunciation, reminiscent of the prophetic liberation, liberating tradition of the Bible, a discursive style associated with theologies of liberation of contemporary times. As the noted Lutheran religious historian Martin Marty puts it, the Dominican friar was for justice, truth, and the rights of the Indians. He would shout as loud as he thought necessary. Here's uh, the gift of preaching from the Dominicans. Certainly, Las Casas knew how to cause muted signs to speak. So here you go. Um, unlike Rashomon, the movie, which gave a hearing to a dead samurai's testimony about his own death through a medium, it's impossible for me to summon the spirit of the dead to testify, right? Wrong. Please turn off the lights. Let's uh, start the seance. <laughs> Analogous to Rashomon's testimony from the grave, the Cholula massacre has its own ghost witnesses who are made to speak through a medium. That medium, I submit, is archaeology. 
For more than a century, Cholula had been the site of archaeological investigations where a considerable number of burials have been discovered. This includes 600 burial sites within the vicinity of the Great Pyramid and 671 on the grounds of San Gabriel, which is the convent and church of the Franciscans, a 10-minute walk from the base of the pyramid. These yielded artifacts and dated coins that point to the time of the massacre. Found skeletal remains in mass burials were positioned in a manner consistent with Catholic mortuary custom, on their backs in an extended position with the head turned toward the east corresponding to Christian practice. You know, the ancient church believed that in the resurrection of the dead, uh, when Jesus returns, he will return where the sun rises, which is in the east. So the corpses are turned towards the east so that when Jesus returns, they'll be ready to meet him. Interesting. <laughs> so anyway, why did I share this? It's because Christians did the burial here and were implicated. And that's what archaeologists say. Now, many of them were in a decapitated or dismembered state and bear cut marks inflicted by sharp instruments. Moreover, it is disturbing to learn that almost half of the buried remains were of young children and women, and some of them were pregnant, heavy with child. Such telltale archeological evidence conflate as indicators of the barbarous excess of suffering caused by an incident of Spanish colonial genocide. One might say then that archeology span raises from the dead, the women and children of Cholula and summons them to the witness stand. The slain and the silence testify, Hernan Cortes is an unreliable narrator, a false writer. He's a liar. The Rashomon effect demonstrates that there is one shared reality, the Cholula massacre, that was of such signal impact that it ignited at least 12 known written accounts. I only shared a few here. Um, an indigenous visual depiction and a grim narrative pieced together by archeological discoveries holding divergent voices in dialectical tension, allowing them to be heard, undermines the presumption of a singular God voice. At times in our interdisciplinary work, we contextual theologians and missiologists tend to rely too heavily on one perspective or proposition, taking it as truth and then using it to support a theological argument without giving due consideration to other voices and perspectives. Now, the Rashomon effect is a cautionary tale against idolizing what I describe as a textual God voice, history stole from the perspective of the victors, cultural narratives dictated from above, and yes, the phenomenon of muted signs that will never be heard unless we cause them to speak anew. I say it again, at stake here is the very notion of enculturation. Or if the local culture was never really give, given an equal seat at the Lord's table, how could there have been a new creation at all? In his book, Anatomy of Enculturation, the esteemed theologian, Tanzanian theologian, Laurenti Magessa describes the shape of the encounter between missionary Christianity and African culture in terms that reiterate mutuality as the cornerstone of an authentic process of enculturation. The word in the gospel encounters the word in the culture. The revelation of God in the Christian scriptures meets the God who is already present in the values of the culture and in the history of the people. The two bond together, transforming and fulfilling each other in the process. And in the same process, people's perceptions and self-understanding on one hand and of God in their midst on the other are changed. The apostolic exhortation Querida Amazonia from 2020 advocates for a renewed enculturation. 
where the church is admonished to listen to ancestral wisdom, the voices of elders, and the rich stories of the original communities. This study proposes a semiotic moment. Semi semiotics is the study of science, simply put, toward Pope Francis' reconciling vision of enculturation. In order for us to achieve this, we will need to make muted science to speak. After all, Christianity is neither monocultural nor monotonous, as the Pope asserts in another document, the encyclical Evangelic Gaudium. Edward Schkilovic expresses a similar call as an imperative. He says, for the signs of the times do not speak, we must cause them to do so. In the longer view of my project, I explore enculturation as a locus for reconciliation, which is one of the charisms of my religious community, the missionaries of the precious blood. But how am I to journey further when the story of the pyramid beneath the church is a brutal, sanguineous massacre of thousands of indigenous Mexicans, not just warriors, but the artisans and storytellers, pregnant women and little children, executed in their own land by European invaders who claim that the unspeakable violence is part of the will of the Christian God. This was not a site of reconciliation at all. Truth be told, this was a crime scene. My precious blood confrere and late mentor, Robert Schreider, in his work on healing and reconciliation, remind us, for a Christian, truth-telling is more than relating facts in a credible manner. It involves God, who is the author of all truth. This is the theological ground zero where muted science can speak anew. Enculturation as reconciliation is a performance, a journey, a praxis. On the feast day of Santuario de la Virgen de los Remedios, the church atop the pyramid, a a constant flow of local devotees, limping elderly men and women, toddlers who are just beginning to walk, energetic Gen Z students and their slow going parents are trekking up the steep pyramid slope toward the apex where the church stands. On this cold, windy and rainy September morning with emergency crackers and bottled water in my secret pockets, just in case, you know, I am walking in an overly careful, deliberate pace, a little embarrassed that I am constantly being overtaken by everybody, and I mean everybody. Trying to catch my breath, I realize that the Cholula faith community itself, in their pilgrimage of faith and fortitude, has been cumulatively transforming the site into a pyramid of paradox. To virtually witness such an organic and eloquent expression of wounded hope was a humbling, awe-inspiring experience. Standing at this point with a per perspective from below, I could see the peak of the pyramid. It is the line where the earth meets the sky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. This is really a in-depth study. Very interesting for me. I'm not familiar with all of this history and that into such depth in that way. And the unmuted voices of indigenous peoples. I mean, I can relate to that as well. And uh, what you talked about here is very, thank you very much. You really open up very great research you're doing in your study time. <laughs> So we now open it up for our questions. Um, we have a microphone in the back that can be brought, and I'd ask you to use that when you're raising a reflection or a question. We'll start in the room, and then we'll shift to the Zoom for people who may have questions there. So uh, who would like to start us off here?
Okay, Lori, bring them back. Here we are. Thank you, Ton. Um, brilliant as always. Um, I, I'm I'm almost stunned into silence, which really doesn't happen to me too often. So I'll try to quickly recover. Um, when I was thinking of looking at your images and the church built on top of the indigenous holy space, um, it reminded me because I. Um, it reminded me, because I do have worked in archaeology, that a lot of places in the ancient world had holy sites that were then torn down and rebuilt by whatever the, the faith was that was coming along. <clears throat> and I've excavated those sites. What I haven't done was ever thought about <clears throat> the cost of the people at the time. I've looked at the, the remains, I've looked at the excavation, but I lost the human element. And so I think what you've done brilliantly in teaching these stones to talk is to help us re-remember the cost of faith over time. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laurie. And I... I can understand how you connected with the archaeological piece because you do this all the time in, in Bible studies. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I did was to have a conversation with native informants of the place. I have um, two Mexican historians as conversation partners, two of them based in Mexico and one based in California, I'm a Chicana. And I asked the question, do people remember? Guess what? Um, an older person who will remain unnamed, in, in, in maybe almost 90 years old, who's a friar, I asked him this question, and his answer was, oh, people don't remember. They go about their lives, you know, it's so far away, so distant, they don't remember this. I asked a professor of history what he thought about that response, and he said, the older folk don't remember, but Gen Z remembers. Gen, I mean, the place is full of murals of the colonial experience. I saw a mural in a restaurant painted by a Gen Z artist of the massacre. And uh, according to the professor, for the younger generation, these are questions that need to be answered. Uh, and they appreciate memory. So I have a lot of hope knowing that, you know, that the younger generation uh, understand the value of memory, and in this case, dangerous memory, as we call it in systematic theology. It militates against the uh, present day status quo um, because something did happen there, and we need to find that in order to find reconciliation in the present. It's a diachronic process, as you would uh, call it in Bible. But thank you, Laurie. Appreciate it. You want to try that microphone? Another question, a comment, reflection here? Thank you, Tan, for, for, for that wonderful presentation. When you were showing, you showed images, when you show images from, from the church, uh, uh, Santa Maria de, yeah, when you saw, when you, showed images, this is my first time of seeing a depiction of, the, of Mary with a crucifix on her neck. So I, I'm wondering if there is, if, if there is any, um, in all the depiction of a painting or, or sculptured image of Mary, I, I have not seen one where she's wearing a necklace of a crucifix, but I did see that in that, uh, in that church. So I was just wondering. Thank you for that uh, astute noticing. I'll take note of that. I'd never 
I was more concentrated on the indigenous pieces that I I didn't see that. Uh, but thank you. I'll, I'll I'll need to take a second look. I appreciate that comment. Yeah, but it. I mean, just offhand, I mean, it would make sense that a Mary, a Mary holding a crucifix would point to uh, the passion of Jesus Christ, and it's almost like a, it reflects a kind of virtual stigmata that your post-colonial community uh, all possess collectively. And uh, I think that's worth looking into. Thank you. Okay. Well, as a Mexican and indigenous roots, with indigenous roots, thank you for voicing the history of my people. One comment, um, UC Berkeley did a lot of research on the numbers of the people who were killed and surpasses the 90 million in the Mesoamericas from the Mexico to Peru and the South. Over 90 million people in a period of 50 years. UC Berkeley has a wonderful um, uh, research. The, the enculturation and the faith imposed, no, uh, the pain, the pain of the faith imposed is still alive. Maybe the professor you mentioned or the history is not um, obvious as it's supposed to be, but our tatas and tatas and tatiks have been in charge to still transmitting. My grandfather, my my grandfather was Tanishano, and we heard the stories of the oppression, but the faith. And we know that faith hidden um, our Christ the faith in the God of life did not come in a boat. It was already there. But the encounter has been painful. But I think the young generations, I, I live in the States for so long, but the people in my town <clears throat> are trying to recuperate the language, the history, the faith, and the art. So thank you because you are doing a great job here. But in many small towns, the artists are still alive. The oppression is still alive, but the recuperation is also still alive. So everything is coming together. I don't know how. Thank you. Thank you. That's an important uh, comment, especially coming from a native Mexican. I really, really appreciate your input. It reminds me of, remember that church, the Nanzintla. Did you know that? Officially, it should be under the Diocese of Puebla, but it was given autonomy. The community itself runs the church. And uh, a few years ago, there was a move by the council and, and some businessmen to create, to transform it into a smart city, you know, like Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Like everything is automated. There are um, hotspots everywhere, uh, you know, technologically advanced city. And guess what? The people unanimously voted no. And one of the uh, voices of the elders, a, an elderly woman who's a native of uh, Tunanzintla said, you want to destroy our culture because you are ashamed of your roots. I was stunned when I read that. I go, wow, that is exactly uh, the prophetic liberating voice that needs to be said. Uh, and uh, But I'm glad, I'm so happy to hear that they run their own parish. They even do their own thing about pres preservation of the church. You know, it's prohibited to take pictures. A number of the pictures here are sold, sold at the foyer of the church. It's like, if you want pictures, we'll sell them to you because the proceeds go to the maintenance of the church. And uh, so it's just... Uh, it, it corroborates what you're saying that, you know, it's not also true that the older generation had forgotten. 
Uh, it seems like it depends who you're talking to. Maybe his circle uh, forgot or he thinks that they had forgotten, but I, I don't think so. You're right. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to try something else here. We have a person in the back room who is looking at the chat conversations. So if you could, if you on the chats, do you have any questions that have come forward? No. So Frank has raised a hand on Zoom, so we can we can pick it from him. Okay, Frank, I'm not sure how that's going to come through. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, that's great, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Father Simpson, for your wonderful presentation, yet very eye-tearing, because uh, when I consider the atrocities caused in the name of salvation, no? I do not know if you have any interest trying to trace back to find when this uh, violence began in doing mission. Because uh, Jesus never imposed himself on anybody, neither did the apostles do the same, or even St. Paul. So before we gained freedom in the Roman Empire, you realize that we were very sober and we did our mission activity in a very simple and humble way. But I'm beginning to think that when we had freedom and power, when we were integrated into the Roman Empire and we had all the authority, that is when we begin to think that salvation must be forced on people. And so we made it that you must, you must be saved. But when we did not have power, we did not have authority, we did it quietly, and even we did, we had a dialogue, which you could read in the Acts of the Apostles. So they did happen because we had freedom of power, and we began to abuse it. If it's abuse of power and freedom, then it seems we have no right to critique politicians who abuse power today. Because when we had it, we also abuse it, and even we did worse things than politicians are doing today. So I am beginning to think that maybe you have any intentions of trying to go back to see when all this started, when mission became, or salvation had to be forced on people, when before we had our freedom, we did it gently and soberly. That's something I'm just contemplating on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those are very uh, profound thoughts, uh, especially from the perspective of mission. And, you know, I highly recommend Roger's book, uh, Prophetic Dialogue, which explains a lot of the methodology of, you know, a dialogical approach to miss mission that is respectful of the local culture. But, but thank you for that input. Certainly uh, worth thinking about. Okay, I don't see another hand on Zoom. Okay, is there anybody else in the room that'd like to offer something here? A question or a comment? Oh, here, let's see. Okay, I see Paul Shepard. Can you show your face, Paul? There. Yeah, doing it one step at a time. <laughs> okay, good. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cecil. That was a wonderful lecture. Um, I was sort of curious um, about the, you were talking about the Russian one effect. Um, like when I was in high school, I actually, I guess I had the misfortune of encountering people. Um, it seemed like a niche group to me um, who really did actually believe Cortez's account of the, uh, the um, basically like the conquest and all the genocide. They actually took his side. Um, other than that, though, and this was this was like a very niche sector of the Catholic Church. Um, are there are there other people around um, that still use that that narrative to justify oppression, or is that I'm just wondering how niche that actually is nowadays? Because I feel like it's good that there's research now that's coming and showing that that's false. So I'm just wondering is that still mainstream? Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, this is a conjecture because I haven't done critical studies on that specific question. But I guess those who are convinced that because the longer view was like a conversion, the violence is justified. Actually, uh, the uh, pioneering Franciscans, the first wave, not, not the succeed, the succeeding waves realized that they had to be 
uh, Christian, <laughs> the ir irony of it. But the initial wave of, of Franciscans approved of the violence. In fact, there was an official order from the central province of the Franciscans who said that leading by example is the main missiological strategy and we cannot tolerate violence. So what Cortes done, had done actually was illegal. He was not authorized to invade Mexico, um, but the Mexicans approved. I mean, uh, the, uh, the friars approved, the Franciscan friars, the first wave of Franciscan friars approved of the violence. And uh, yeah, it's not an excuse that they were men of their times. I hear that a lot. They're men of their times and they had another perspective. But look, as someone, I think it was, uh, was it Paul or um, who was the previous person who asked the question? The Acts of the Apostles already shows us, you know, Paul in the Areopagus, who dialogued with uh, the Athenians who were worshiping the unknown God. Uh, it's a paradigm of dialogue from the Acts of the Apostles. And what about the um, missionaries of the same generation? For example, St. Francis Xavier in Japan, who ha had a high respect of the Japanese that he, it pained him to leave Japan, actually, even though uh, in the end, there were very few Japanese who continued to be Christians. Um, Francis Xavier showed a tremendous respect for the culture, even though his, mess his religious message was different from the native religion. What about Matteo Ricci in China? Uh, Denobili in India? Um, and also Francis Xavier in India, actually, um, who were all stellar examples, exemplars of what mission should be, even at the same period as the pioneering Franciscans. Now, one explanation historically is that, you know, unlike the Dominicans who were sophisticated theologians like Bartolomé de las Casas, they said that the original Franciscans who went there were actually mendicants who had no idea about mission. So they were more of like a, yeah, they were greenhorns who uh, were learning as they went, as they proceeded. And uh, no excuse, but it just shows you that, um, yeah, it's not an, a val as far as I'm concerned, and even in my previous work, I said this, it's not a valid excuse or argument that they were men of their time because even men who predated them already had, how about a basic Christian respect for the dignity and, and value of human life? Uh, that's a non non-negotiable in Christianity. So yeah, those things uh, factor certainly in how we read them. But uh, about present day thinking, I hope not, but I don't know. Maybe uh, those who represent a certain extreme right position might uh, be more concerned about apologia, about church history than correctness or uh, moral um, sort of acceptability of certain acts. I, I'll need to look into that, but that's a great question. I'll uh, certainly um, try to uh, negotiate through that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tone. I think we're gonna bring this to a conclusion now. I know there are more questions, so certainly you stressed our minds in this way, but some of the questions also stretch you a bit, looking at other questions too, in terms of history and mission and things like that. Again, let us give a applause, uh, give a word, Thanks for your time. And thank you for very stimulating and creative. Yeah, good, thank you. We're now gonna have um, a little reception outside in the pre-function area here. Uh, those of you on Zoom, you'll have to do it for yourselves. Go to, your, go to your own kitchens and find something that you can enjoy. But anyways, uh, again, I wanna thank all of you for coming, those of you in person and those on Zoom. Thank you very much for coming for our annual Elizabeth Dick Lecture. Thank you. <laughs>